Hi, thank you all for coming. Lily, Lily, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Many pages of questions. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a lot to cover. So, um, Ready. Um, I am Amy Freeman, Development Director at the Writer Center, a literary arts nonprofit in Bethesda, Maryland, and also around the world now, um, supporting writers and people who want to write. Um, we have online workshops starting at $25 an hour. No, yeah, $25 for an hour, 20, starting at $25, but we also have um, scholarships available. Um, literary events like these are free. Um, if you want to donate to us, you can, but the money, the Venmo, PayPal, writers, um, Zach will put the links in later. The money will, will only go to scholarships now. That's, we're only up, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so tonight we want you to buy books if you want to. Zach is going to give the link for Old Town Books, an indie bookseller, which has Lily's current book and Lily's future books. And well, burn it down. <laughs> just like hold it up the whole time. Yeah, just um, okay, so here I'm going to read this quickly. Lily is a contributing contributing editor at Catapult, an assistant editor at Barrelhouse Books. Woo! She's the editor of Burn It Down, a critically and acclaimed anthology of essays on women's Eggerson Seal Press, which left me repeatedly gutted, and I recommend. Um, named one of the most recommended books of the season by the Literary Hub and the author of Negative Space, which we're going to discuss, a reported and illustrated memoir selected by Carmen Maria Machado as a winner of the Santa Fe, Writer, Santa Fe Writers Project Literary. Santa Fe Lit <laughs> Santa Fe Writers Project Literary Awards forthcoming in 2021. Lily is the founder and host of Memoir Monday, which if you're not subscribing, you should, a reading series co-curated by Narratively, The Rumpus, Guernica, Granta, Long Reads, and Catapult, featured by, featuring the best memoir writers of today. Her writing has been published by Long Reads, Washington Post, Glamour, Playboy, Rolling Stone, and more. I'm sorry I took up all that time because you all know that because that's why you're here. So Lily, if you could, I mean, good Lord. Not only did I love Burn It Down and you should all buy it um, at Old Town Books, but I bought it for other people. It's an incredible collection. Can you bring us into the world of Burn It Down by reading a little bit of the preface? Yes. Um, and there was a particular part you wanted me to read, right? Just the first part? The preface, like right up to get out of the way. Mm-hmm. Spoiler. Okay, so hold it up here so you can see it. Um, no, hold it down here so I can see it. That makes more sense. <clears throat> All right, so this is, you know, there's a short introduction here at the front. Um, I'm just gonna read the first short section. Uh, it says, throughout history, angry women have been called harpies, bitches, witches, and whores. They've been labeled hysterical, crazy, dangerous, delusional, bitter, jealous, irrational, emotional, dramatic, vindictive, petty, hormonal. They've been shunned, ignored, drugged, locked up, and killed. Kept in line with laws and threats of violence, and with insidious, far-reaching lies about the very nature of what it means to be a woman. That a woman should aspire to be a lady, and that ladies don't get angry. Millennia of conditioning is hard to unlearn. Even when asked specifically to write about their anger, Many of the women in this book described it at first from a safe distance, explaining coolly and calmly what they were angry about. They were so accustomed to having to rationally justify any emotion they might feel while making sure not to actually display that emotion. But even in a book about anger, a big part of the editing process was me saying, it's okay, get angry, and pushing writers to put their anger on the page. The more that happened, the more I realized that that was what I wanted this book to be. I wanted this to be a place where our anger could live, a place for us to take up space after generations of being told to shrink, to rage after a lifetime of being told to behave. I wanted these pages to sizzle and smoke with women's awesome rage, no longer tucked away or extinguished, but right here on the surface. So get ready or get out of the way. Tell us about the book. How did it come to be? Um, it came about um, because I had just 
contributed an essay to another anthology that Seal put out. It was the, the new edition of Without a Net, which is edited by Michelle T. And it's essays about uh, women's experiences growing up working class. Um, and so I contributed an essay to that. And the editor who I worked with um, was not Michelle T. It was an editor at the press because they were you know, just adding a few new pieces to reissue the book. Um, and I had a great experience with her and we hit it off. And so when they developed this idea in house that they wanted to do an anthology of essays about anger, um, she came to me. <laughs> Which, you know, I was like, have you been reading my Twitter feed? Or, you know, how, how did you know that, yes, I would absolutely love to do that project. Um, and so we kind of talked about the concept and, and, you know, what we wanted it to focus on, but um, kept it pretty open ended because I wanted the submissions that I got in to kind of to dictate the direction of the book, you know, and, and I knew, kind of, as I just described in that beginning of the introduction, that once I started working with these writers and started seeing what themes were coming up over and over again in their pieces, that would help me kind of create the organizing principle as it happened. Um, so I sent out a call to some writers who I had worked with before who you know, I knew I liked their work and some who were like, you know, dream writers who I, I had never had an opportunity to work with before, but thought this might be a good opportunity to do so. Um, and kind of went from there. You know, most of the pieces were direct solicitations where I, I reached out to the writers directly and, and said, hey, are you angry about anything? <laughs> Want to tell me about it? Um, <laughs> and then after, you know, I got most of the pieces that way. And then there were a few specific topics that hadn't been touched on yet because I didn't want to direct anybody, you know, and tell and say, like, I want, want you to write about anger and, and this topic. I wanted them to really just come to me with it authentically and like what was really on their mind. But I also knew there were certain things that had to be covered, like anger and motherhood, anger and menopause, anger and the angry black woman stereotype, uh, you know, so there were a few that I didn't get from the direct calls and I put out a public call for pitches for those. And that's how it happened. And you were flooded, I would, I would guess. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, what was the experience of plowing through all that rage? Was it empowering? Was it overwhelming? I mean, that's, that's, it's, each of the essays, to me, I, I'm guessing, I mean, it's felt like each of the essays um, hit on a particular aspect of anger that's available to, you know, it's available to different groups, but sort of universal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there were moments when it was overwhelming, but more so like the logistical process was overwhelming. But you know, the, the pieces themselves and the, the content and the essays was mostly just really wonderful. And it, you know, it felt very cathartic and nurturing for me to be surrounded by these like brilliant articulations of all of these big, powerful, feelings that I was also having <laughs> and you know to, to remind myself that there are a lot of us out there that are angry and that you know collectively we can do something with that um, you know I did the, the way the timing worked out I, I was doing the last pass on all these essays during um, Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing <laughs> and jaw, jaw clench yeah you know so I, I was like in a very raw emotional angry state as I know a lot of of people were during that time and so having these essays to return to during that it, it was actually very soothing even though they're they're very fiery angry essays um was there anything um that surprised you that was universal and unique or unique universal or unique in terms of, the, because you, you, I mean, there are, there are black women, white women, trans women, just, you know, a broad array of women writing about um, the human experience. And I'm interested in what connected it and what, oh God, I sound like a yoga teacher. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it, oh, right. okay, carry on. It was really striking to me how many of these writers wrote about not feeling like they had access to their own anger and not feeling like they were allowed to feel it and to such an extent that 
for large periods of their lives, they didn't even actually realize that they were angry. <laughs> they had so successfully suppressed it. Um, but everyone who wrote about that also wrote about the fact that that doesn't work forever. <laughs> and they wrote about all of the unexpected and, and often damaging ways that anger found to get out when they had been suppressing it. Um, so that was, that was a good reminder for me, I think, and, and for readers. Reminder of? To not, you know, to let yourself feel your anger, that, that ignoring it and pushing it down um, doesn't actually make it go away. I would like to talk to you about this a lot more, but I'm going to move on to page two. So, Lily, congratulations on your Santa Fe Writers Project win um, to be published for Negative Space, which is a reported and illustrated memoir. And you did actually defeat me, but that's, you know, we can talk about that. <laughs> Um, so what is, it's fantastic, and tell, tell us what is in the book, what is a reported and illustrated memoir, what is negative space, when is it coming out, tell us all the things. Yeah, um, it's coming out spring 2021, we don't have an exact date yet, but uh, I think we will soon, by April or May. Um, and the book is about my father, who was an artist, um, and he was also a heroin addict, and he died when I was 12. And so the book is about my experience starting when I was about 20 of trying to find a new way to get to know him and, and trying to learn more about who he was as a person, because um, I only knew him as a kid, you know, and I idealized him, even though he was a troubled guy in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, I used his artwork as kind of a map to dig into the broader, realer, messier story of his life. Um, and so it started out, originally it was going to be uh, an artist monograph, like a big coffee table art book. Um, but along the way, I kept appearing in the story in ways that I hadn't expected to. And, and every time I got feedback from anyone, they always said like, wait, we want to see more of you. We want to see you reacting to all these things you're learning. And we want to see what, like, what is this process like of researching your father's life? Um, so I didn't actually set out to write a memoir, but it became a memoir um, over the course of about 10 years worth of writing and editing. Um, so it ended up being kind of a braided narrative with his story and my story, and then also the story of finding his story. <laughs> uh, so the, re the reported element is that um, I actually include a lot of the interviews that I did. You know, I know a lot of memoirists do interviews kind of for background research, but I made the process of interviewing people who knew him um, a main part of the story. Um, and then it's illustrated with images of his artwork. Wow. Um, so 10 years. You're yeah. overnight success, right? Ten years of <laughs> yes. overnight success. So, um, what, what, how, what form was it always in that? So, can you just talk a little bit more about the process? I mean, of how many iterations you wrote before? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> better, yeah. I think the the version that I ended up submitting to the Santa Fe Writers Project was saved on my computer as draft twenty seven, but. I don't, you know, there were, of course, lots of smaller changes within that. And it, it's, I don't think there are any words or sentences in this version that were in the original draft <laughs> that I wrote when I was 21 and thought I was writing an artist monograph. So yeah, it, it was a long process, um, but it was one of those things where you, you learn to write the book while you're writing the book, which is something I've heard from a lot of authors. There, there was no way to sit down and and just write this version of it. You have to figure out what it is while you're writing it. Which I'm hoping will not be true for my next book. I have grand plans about just sitting down and writing it perfectly start to finish, but. Oh, you know, just set aside three weeks. Set aside three weeks, I'm sure. Just, you yeah. know. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I love Santa Fe Writers Project. Um, so your decision to go with a small press, yep, yeah, I raised the roof there. Your decision to go with a small press, which I applaud, um, is great and interesting and not the path everyone chooses. And 
for the writers in the house, and I'm guessing there are some, can you discuss that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, for me, it comes down to having a say and being able to be a partner in the process. Um, you know, Andrew, who I know is in, in this Zoom somewhere, because I just saw him post in the chat, but Andrew, Andrew who's the publisher of the Santa Fe Writers Project is um, really great in that collaborative sense, you know, and I've been able to be involved and have a say uh, in every step of the process, which is really important to me. Um, I know some people are intimidated by the idea of a small press because of the idea that you have to do a lot more of the publicity heavy lifting yourself, but that's pretty true across the board, unless you're like the very, very top of the list at a big five and they are flying you around the country to do a tour, um, which you wouldn't be able to do right now anyway. Right, I mean, no one is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I think wherever you publish, you have to be your own advocate when it comes to getting eyeballs on your book and getting sales and, you know, doing events, taking opportunities when they're offered to you um, to come and talk to people about your book. Uh, it's not going to be a success without you doing that hustle as the author. So my thinking was, if I'm going to have to hustle either way, I might as well do it with a publisher that will let me also be involved and have opinions and you know, let things be how I envision them for something that I've been working on for such a long time and, and, and know what, how I want things to be. And Andrew knows I'm opinionated and kind of a pain in the ass, but he's been great. He's <laughs> been a great sport. So. So, um, uh, has your family, this is a curveball, has your family read the memoir? Um, my mother read a much older version when it was mostly still my father's story, and I, I let her read it mostly for fact-checking purposes, um, because a lot of the story takes place in before I was born or when I was very, very young. So, you know, I couldn't just rely on my own memory. Um, she has not read it since I added a lot more of my own story, which also includes stuff about my relationship with her. Um, but, you know, I had, while I was writing it, I had to just pretend that she would never read it. And, <laughs> and Lamont, right? Yeah. yeah, just write as though everybody, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm planning to write uh, a preface specifically for her that I will print out and put in the front of her <laughs> copy. Um, so let's start moving toward talk about writing and editing. And it is 5.20, so at about 5.30, we'll start opening it up to questions. And if there are none, you know, yeah, I think there'll be a few. So, okay, so Lily, you're a writer and an editor. So when you were doing this memoir, how, how, did, that, how did that dovetail? Do you, do you edit your own work? Do you have beta readers? Do you, how does it work for you? Which hat do you wear? Uh, <laughs> um, I have to try really hard to turn off my editing brain when oh. I'm writing. Um, right. And just, you know, let it flow and, and let the first drafts be garbage. Um, and, you know, sometimes I, I tell myself I'm just making notes as opposed to writing a draft because that makes it easier for me to step away from perfectionism and, and just let ideas go onto the page. Um, and then I go back and make them pretty later. Um, and then once I have a draft, I do my best to read my own work like an editor. Um, Which were you first? A uh, writer, definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, there's only so far that you can edit your own work, I think, you know, even if you are reading it like an editor and even if, you know, I definitely have learned a lot from editing that I apply to my own work, but you still need other people to read your stuff. Um, I have a writer's group. We meet once a week and we've been meeting, we've been a group for about three years and we just take turns trading work and that's been invaluable. Um, finding readers who, whose opinion I trust and also who know my work and know where I'm trying to go with my work, you know, so they, they don't give me the feedback of like, well, if I were writing this piece, I would do it this way, which is not helpful, right? Because it's not your piece, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you're not, you know, you're actually not, you, the, the point is to make what you're writing the best it can be for what you want it to be, not what 
Exactly. So having a writer's group that, that gets, you know, that gets me and <laughs> gets what I'm trying to do has been really, really helpful. But I mean, so, um, all right, well, just before we go ahead. So, okay. I just, I, I meant to do this very early on, but, um, so creative nonfiction, personal essay, memoir. Mm -hmm. I submit, I, I think I write personal essay. Lately I've said I write creative nonfiction because I think it makes me cooler. Um, what is the difference among the three? I mean, you're, you're a fabulous editor who gets all this stuff. So what's the difference between among the three? Um, my maybe controversial opinion is that I don't really distinguish between the three that much. Um, I mean, there are differences, obviously, you know, an essay is its own standalone piece. Um, but I, you know, I think a lot of the same rules apply. And I think most of the distinctions that people make between those categories are distinctions that work for them in their head or distinctions that work for, you know, their submission guidelines, if, if they're a press, um, but that they're very flexible and fluid. Um, so for me, I just, I don't know, I write nonfiction, I write, you know, or personal nonfiction, or sometimes I say I'm an essayist and memoirist. Um, so you actually, you said the same rules apply. So that implies to me that you have a structure. So what, <laughs> what, what rules are those, Lily? Um, I mean, you know, I guess rules in terms of the standards you hold yourself to for telling the truth and what that means and how far you're allowed to kind of fill in details that you might not remember specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and rules like, you know, creating narrative tension or creating some kind of tension for the reader that's going to draw them through, you know, the distinction between a piece of nonfiction that's meant to be consumed by an audience versus like, you know, the, the dreaded diary entry, right? Um, wait, 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 why is it, why is it dreaded? <laughs> bunny, those also work as bunny ears. Yes. Um, I guess because, I mean, because di diary entry or, um, you know, confessional is, is often used to disparage personal essay writing or memoir. I think mean, most often when it's by women, um, you know, who dare to use introspection as a lens for art. Um, and I think that it's not always that cut and dry. You know, so one of my favorite books is The Diary of Anais Nin. You know, that's literally a diary and it's brilliant and engaging. Um, so yeah, you, you, you know, dreaded diary is in quotes because it's loaded. I think, mean, you know, it's, it's a loaded and kind of political conversation to talk about whether confessional writing is, is actually less valuable. Um, but I do think that even if it is confessional, you have to do something to turn it into art and turn it into something that will be enjoyable for someone other than you or people who already know and care about you. Well, that, so, um, so that's actually, you were talking about having a, a close critique group mm -hmm. who knows you and knows, your, knows your, your work. Do you ever feel like you need someone to read your work and comment on it who doesn't know your backstory, doesn't know anything about you. Because sometimes I find like, I, I don't want people, I want, I want somebody coming fresh to it. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, you know, when it gets to that point, that's when I submit it, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's what editors at publications are, right? Then they will tell you like, yes, this is interesting for somebody who doesn't know or care about you or no thank you, next. You know? yeah. Well, thank you for writing that segue, not, not, not the kind that like we, you know, people ride around on, which is not me. Um, who is not me? So let's go behind the editing curtain. So you are a fabulous acclaimed editor. Um, take us behind the curtain. Okay, so there, I, I submit. I hit submittable. Mm -hmm. And I refresh, refresh, refresh. What's happening on your end? Um, like literally nuts and bolts, because I'm guessing people don't all hear no, because I actually don't. So just tell me. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, I have actually extricated myself from submittable at this point and, um, gotten to a point where I'm working as a contributing editor for two publications, narratively and catapult, which means I only read, um, 
submissions for specific calls that I put out that are specifically things that I'm interested in. Um, but when I was using Submittable, um, what happens is that your submission will then get assigned to readers, um, either automatically or somebody will do it manually. And that's so that, excuse me. So that's when it shifts to in progress. Yeah, that, that just means it's been assigned to a reader. It doesn't necessarily mean that anybody has read it. Um, unless it's automatic, then I think it doesn't go to in progress until somebody opens it. But, you know, um, and then, I mean, it's different at different publications, but, you know, I think a common way is that readers will read it and comment on it. Sometimes that reader will direct, will uh, directly send you a rejection. Sometimes it has to go through a few levels of readers, you know, from like, volunteer readers and interns to editors to like a top editor who has to approve it, which is why sometimes it takes a long time to hear back because each of those editors has a submittable queue with anywhere from five to 500 submissions in it and that, you know, they have to stay on top of. So, yeah. So, um, so let's talk about rejections for a moment. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to ask the questions I want for one more minute, and then we'll just open it up to everybody. And, it, it, and if you put questions in the chat, if you put a big Q in front of it, that will help me because I'm middle-aged. Um, um, so um, do you or have you, what, what do you have to say about tiered rejections? Can you explain that to people and, and whether it's a real thing or whether it's just something that makes me... Yeah, what, what do you think? Yeah, sure. Tiered rejection is a thing. Yeah, so I mean, most places and most editors have, you know, their most basic, thank you so much, I'm going to have to pass kind of form rejection, right? Which you probably are all familiar with for all writers, right? Um, I've, I've heard that happens, I've, not yet, but yeah. No, never, never. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> um, and then a tiered rejection is when you know maybe it, it got through one more level of consideration and you might get a slightly more personalized rejection um that might give you more of a reason well lately to be honest when i'm doing my calls um you know that the upside is that i'm not getting all the random slush from submittable but the downside is that when i do calls directly to my email i don't have a reader helping me i have to sift through all of them so I put out a call on Twitter, I usually get between 100 and 300 responses, and I have to read through all of them. And so in what time period? I usually give myself three weeks. Um, I try to be quick, you know, partly because I am also a writer, and so I know that people are waiting anxiously, um, and also partly because I hate getting follow-up emails so I try to outrun them. Well, uh, should we send them? Mm -hmm. should, should people who are not me because you know yeah. <laughs> follow-ups. I think it depends on the editor. You know, I I'm very organized and I move pretty quickly and I, I respond to everybody in a pretty timely fashion. So I, you know when I get a follow-up email it's like you're just sending me extra email like why you know don't I don't need it. Why are you sending me another email? but I know that other editors feel differently, you know, and they might, things might get lost or they might be, you know, distracted by a million other things. And so they find a follow up helpful. So I, you know, I won't make any general proclamations about the benefits or negatives of follow up emails. But. Except to you, don't do it people. She's yeah. So my last <laughs> question, been, you know, usually I'll say like, unless it's been a month, cause you know, it has happened like three times in the last, however many years that, you know, somebody sends a follow-up email and I actually didn't see their original one. Um, but it's rare. Yeah. And you don't need to follow up like three days after you send a pitch. <laughs> I will it's, it's been an hour and a half. I'm just wondering. Later. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So my last question before I, before I turn to the, to the group chat and go for it at a queue or a question mark. Um, are there any tropes or overdone things that you're just like, you open it up, you're like, no. And the other, the flip side is what makes a piece sing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, right now, coronavirus essays, I mean, I know, I know everybody's going through it 
and everybody just, just 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 don't don't read what I sent you. <laughs> um, I I have so far assigned one coronavirus essay, and it's coming out tomorrow, and it's great, and I made it. You know, it's an exception to the rule, which I mean, you know, I guess that's the answer. Of what makes a piece sing, right, is when it it stands out, and it's so great that you don't care. If it's the kind of piece you usually wouldn't like, you know, some of my favorite pieces are in categories that I otherwise usually would feel bored of, but I like them because they stand out and, and make me like them anyway. Um, but yeah, aside from, aside from coronavirus essays, which I personally just am not interested in because I feel like it's like we're in the middle of it. It's already everywhere. It's already all the news stories. Like, can we just talk about something else for a little while, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think also, other than that, like the biggest thing that will get an automatic no from me is an essay that is a story that's not really yours to tell. Um, talking about someone else's trauma and how it impacted you or, you know, someone else's, you know, major life defining event and, you know, how it was for you to be on the sidelines of it or to help them with it or whatever. Usually I'm like, well, just have that person send me an essay then. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, that there also are some important social implications to that. I think, you know, I get it a lot from parents, but not exclusively, you know, also from spouses and friends and neighbors and teachers and whatever. Um, but people speaking for other people, like, I don't want you to define someone else's experience for me. I want to hear it directly from them. Um, I am going to the chat stream. Okay. Um, and okay, so Okay, so the first question, what do you look for as an editor to consider a piece? It's a broad, broad question, but um, also applicable to your job, so. <laughs> um, I mean, I look for it first and foremost to directly answer the call that I put out. I put out very specific calls for pitches on Twitter, um, and I give examples and I break down all the elements that I want to see in the piece um, usually includes, you know, it should feel fresh and surprising and should be something I haven't seen before, should have a narrative arc of some kind where we see some internal shift happen in you. Um, there should be some engaging scenes, you know, et cetera, et cetera, writing that checklist. And then I, you know, I always get about 25 to 65 percent of the pitches and submissions I get in response to those calls have none of those things <laughs> not at all related to what I asked for um do you, do you reply to those yeah I just copy and paste you know the thank you for sending I'm gonna have to pass this, Lily. and then and then one time out of 12 you get a really busy right okay yeah. <laughs> um um how did you get started as a writer? What made you decide to go into editing? Um, I, I mean, I started writing when I was a teenager. Like, I think, you know, a lot of us. Diaries? You, I called them journals. Call back. Okay. <laughs> sophisticated. Um, but yeah, basically. Um, and actually, you know, prompted by Anais Nin, I, I first read her diaries when I was 14, 15, and kind of blew my mind. Before that, I had mostly been writing like really, really terrible poetry. Um, and then I was like, oh, I can write about my own life and what I'm thinking and it can maybe be interesting. Um, and then I studied uh, nonfiction in undergrad and then journalism in grad school and then realized I didn't actually want to be a journalist at all. Um, and kind of circled back <laughs> to creative nonfiction. Um, and I got into editing because I had written a few essays for Narratively when I was right out of school. Um, and I was also bartending full time and like trying to build up a freelance career during the afternoon hours between <laughs> sleeping until 3 p.m. and going back to the bar. And 
it was hard, you know, and, and after a couple of years of that, I was like, okay, I really don't want to do this anymore. And I emailed the editor at Narratively, um, cause he was the only person I had written more than one piece for. <laughs> so it's the only editor who I like had any kind of relationship with and basically just asked for a job. Um, and I, I started with a very part-time, like editing one or two pieces a month for them on a kind of trial basis. And, you know, I ended up, that was like six years ago and I, I still am, am tangentially involved with them. So yeah, it kind of built from there. I realized that making other people's writing better is a lot easier than making my own writing better. Um, and the pay is usually steadier. So yeah, that sucked me in. <laughs> Well, you you have made my writing writing better, but um, okay, we got we got infinity um, questions here. So, is pitching non COVID essays right now pointless? And you were saying you were saying earlier that like you want to read other things, and I want to read other things, but like I feel like no one is reading things that are not pandemic-y. Yeah, I mean it's hard. I don't think it's pointless. I think that even the editors who are assigning all corona all the time right now are gonna get sick of it eventually you know <laughs> um you know i mean this we don't know how long this is gonna go on for and, and we can't only talk about coronavirus for a year straight 11 days just 11 yeah. days <laughs> um so i live in georgia i live in georgia yeah so i mean you know i stepped on your answer and i apologize um so what do you think about like okay so you're writing a thing that isn't covid related do you save it or do you submit it i mean i i say submit it why not you know and if it doesn't land anywhere now you can try again later you know um but also just take a look at the website of whatever publication you're pitching and if the last 20 essays they published have all been about coronavirus, then maybe that's an indication that that's what they're looking for, right? But if, you know, if you look at the homepage of Catapult or Narratively, you know, there are one or two coronavirus pieces on there, but there also are a lot of, of other things because we're trying to keep other conversations going, you know, and, and give people other things to read as well. Can you advise on any memoir specific query letter elements? Hmm. Um, I mean, I don't know about memoir specific. I think the, you know, the rules are mostly apply across the board of like, keep it short and sweet and professional and get to the point, you know, start, make it engaging right away make it clear that you actually research that agent and actually want to work with them specifically and that you're not just like sending the same query to every agent that you found in a book, you know, um, <laughs> keep it under a page, you know, to the like, dear so-and-so I'm querying you because of X personalized thing, my memoir title, which is complete at X number of words is blah, 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 short, sexy paragraph, include comp titles, thank them for their time. Um, did you have reporting experience before researching your own family? Interesting. Yeah, um, I was mostly, I started that process when I was still in undergrad um, and I was focusing heavily on journalism at the time. So I was, you know, using the, those tools as I was learning them. Um, and I was also like heavily involved in the student newspaper, uh, like so many of us nerds were, right? Um, so yeah, I, you know, I was, I was kind of learning on the job and, and applying those tools that I was learning in, in class to the project. And then this, you know, in grad school, I was studying journalism specifically, and then I freelanced doing some feature writing before I realized that like essay and memoir was really what I wanted to focus on. So yeah, yes and, yes and no, yeah. <laughs> more, more, a lot more parallel than before, but yeah. Um, how do you deal with family responses to memoir? Asking for a friend. <laughs> how much of their feelings or opinions do you allow for? How do you protect them, if at all? 
Um, I pretend they're not going to happen and then deal with it when it comes. I definitely do not try to anticipate or appease anybody else's opinions in the writing process. Um, I did my best to not really think about that at all until like the last couple passes where I, I looked at a couple sections about my mother and I was like, do I really have to say this this harshly? And you know, found a couple of places to maybe soften a little bit, but I definitely didn't let, you know, the anticipation of other people being offended or hurt change the story. Um, but I also, you know, I've been, my mother has known for 10 years that this book was happening and we've been having conversations about it along the way. And, you know, she's kind of developed more of an understanding of how a memoir works and the fact that this is my version of the story and that I am fully aware that it probably doesn't match up perfectly with hers and that, you know, there's, there's space for that elsewhere, but that inside the book, it's, it's only going to be my story. Sorry, I got distracted by the brilliance of that, but <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Barry wants to know what makes a memoir sing. Um, I mean, my voice. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, you know, this is kind of what I mean by like the same rules apply, right? Like, I think everything that I was talking about that I look for in essay submissions also applies to book length memoir um, and shorter memoir pieces. They just you have to bring something new to the table. You know, it, it needs an exciting story. It needs something that is fresh and different, even if it's not necessarily like the first woman to ever fly, you know, I don't know, whatever. Even if, even if like the, the events of the story are not completely brand new, unique, at least the perspective and details of the experience and details of how you articulate it and what you have to say about it has to feel new. You have to be adding something to the conversation um, and really bring the, bring the reader through the story. You know, I think a lot of, a lot of essay drafts and also book drafts go wrong in that they're, you know, telling the reader what happened rather than recreating the experience of what happened for the reader and putting them in the middle of it and, and bringing them through it. You know, you're, you're not just telling what happened. You're painting the full picture and making the reader feel the emotions that you felt at the time. Well, quibble. <laughs> um, so, um, you and I worked on some pieces and you, you, you said to me, tell us, tell the reader what happened. I mean, you have to do that also. But it, but it can't be just that. <laughs> Fair enough. So you, you, you've got to, you've got to make it. Would you like to just tell us all how you do what you do? Okay. Um, okay. So um, you mentioned the importance of your weekly writing group. Do you have suggestions for writing writers trying to find a group, especially those not in New York City or a major writing center? And I would oh. say that the writer center is launching reading groups, uh, writing groups on Saturday. But Karen. Um, yeah, I mean, my writing group started with a Facebook post, you know, I'm, I mean, I think if you know writers in your area, ask them if they want to start a writing group with you, you know, you don't, you don't have to find one that already exists. You just need like two to eight or so writers who are interested in reading each other's work and willing to be consistent about it. And I think, you know, finding a, an equal level of commitment is important. You know, our, my group kind of did some shape shifting early on where, you know, some people weren't able to come regularly and some people really wanted to come every week and be focused. Um, you know, so some people dropped off and some new people joined and, and whatever. It's a, it's a living, breathing organism, but it's not hard to start. You know, you just need a couple people. So either, either writers who you know, who you want to ask or, you know, try posting on in a local Facebook group somewhere or find some there usually is like you know some writers 
organization or, or group based out of a library or a small workshop or, you know, whatever it may be, something like that, find people there. Um, do you have any thoughts on building a freelance career? <laughs> um, I mean, I guess just that there are no shortcuts. It's hard as hell. Um, you, ha you have to read a lot and identify publications that are doing the kind of work you want to write and really familiarize yourself with them, follow them on social media, read them regularly, follow their editors on social media, get a sense for like what they're looking for, um, write a lot, prepared, be prepared for a lot of rejection, find a way to self-motivate, put yourself on a schedule if you have to. Now I know some people do like send five pitches every Monday or whatever it is. Um, but you know, finding an accountability schedule like that that works for you can be good. Um, I guess that and just embrace the fact that there will never be a perfect, even steady amount of work. <laughs> and the, the feast or famine is just part of freelancing. And, you know, sometimes you're going to feel like you're so overwhelmed and you have way too much work and you can't possibly do it all. And then two weeks later, you'll be freaking out because you have no work and you're scrambling trying to find assignments and it just kind of happens that way. And I think once you know that, I, I tried for a long time, I was like, if I can just time my pitches just right, even that, that I can make it work so that I always have two assignments at a time. And it's just, that's not possible. So accepting that helped. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna get to um, a question in a moment, but I actually, I always find it astounding that writers like you who I think are Super good writers get rejections. Wait. Oh, always. Yeah, everybody gets rejected. You know, can, can I just, I'll send, a, I'll, I'll send an email on your behalf. Just, if they turn you down, Lily, you contact me. I'll mess <laughs> up. No, but just talk, talk to us about the process because you reject people, you have to, and you are rejected, which, which hurts my heart. But can you <laughs> talk about that? It's not personal. I mean, it's, it's never personal unless you're a jerk in your pitch, you know, then it might be personal, but. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to get screenshotted. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, really it's, you know, so much of it, you know, I think when, when writers are starting out and they take it really personally when they're rejected as if it's, you know, a value judgment on their work and as if it's, you know, it means their work is not good or their editor thinks that, that their work is not good and therefore they're an idiot and they don't understand quality when they see it and, you know, blah, 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 blah. We've all heard this before, right? But really, it's very rarely about is this piece good or not. It's about is it a fit for what I'm looking for right now. Um, can, you know, can you talk about that a little bit more about like, like the, the, what is the fit? This isn't a fit for my list. This isn't a fit for, for me right now. Um, I mean, it, it's a combination of personal taste, right? So like first I have to be excited by it. And, you know, sometimes I'll recognize that something is good, but I'm not excited enough by it to like bring it to a meeting and argue for it with people who are going to like poke holes in it and then like work with the writer on several rounds and file paperwork and blah, 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 blah right? Like I have to be really jazzed about a piece because it, it's a lot of work on my side too, right? And then at, at the end, I don't get the excitement of a byline. So I have to be pumped and invested. But then a lot of times there are pieces that I love and that like, if I ran my personal publication, I would absolutely publish. But it's also not just about what I like, it's about the publication's all style um, and the publication's goal and the publication's, you know, metrics about, you know, they've decided that they have too many pieces about X and really want to cover more Y or, you know, whatever it is. Um, a lot of it comes down to style. Uh, narratively has a very specific style, which you'll be able to identify if you go read like four or five personal essays on the site. But they're all very narrative, as you might guess from the name, right? <laughs> um, and they all, you know, it has to involve like external action, like something actually happening, right? They don't publish pieces that are like you on your couch thinking about something. It has to be like you out in the world doing something with active vivid scenes and a really clear narrative arc where there's a significant and tangible change that happens in your life. 
I said, there are a lot of essays that are brilliant, but are not that, right? So if you send something to me for narratively that's brilliant, but it's not that, I'm going to reject it. But that has nothing to do with whether it's good or not. So I am enjoying this. I am learning <laughs> from this. So um, what are these meetings? You're, you're, so you're, you said you bring something to a meeting. What are these meetings of what you <laughs> um, Pitch meetings, you know, sometimes they happen over email. I mean, especially right, like now that's it's all happening over email, right? But also sometimes there are pitch meetings where editors all bring in, you know, a few ideas that they got from writers that they're excited about and they discuss them and they pitch them, you know, either to each other or just to top editors, depending on, you know, the structure of the publication and the, their various merits and faults are debated by, you know, a group of editors and they decide to either assign it or not. Um, so, you know, if you send me a story and I like it, I, you know, I don't run a publication all by myself. I don't have the authority to just say, yes, sold, right? I have to then pitch your pitch to someone else, um, which is why I have to be really excited about it and, and care about it because I have to be able to go and make a case to someone else that this is a piece we really have to publish. Uh, interested, thinking about myself, <laughs> the questions. Um, when you, when submitting a query or pitch for a memoir or personal essay, at what point do you suggest a self-revision or hired help versus stop sending it out altogether? Oh, MK, don't, don't stop, don't stop sending it out. Some pieces stop sending out, but. Okay, I take that <laughs> I, was, I was just, I'm a mother, I've got three kids. Oh no, no, Twitter's. It's good to, it's good to be able to recognize like, you know what, this piece is not actually working and it's fine and I'm gonna scrap it for parts or throw it away. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's tough. I think that's something you have to kind of develop an internal barometer for, right? And it's like, if you're just getting a lot of passes without reason, you know, without reasons being given, then, you know, maybe either put it away for a little while and try and look at it with fresh eyes in a few weeks or a few months, or maybe hire somebody to help you. If you're getting a lot of the same feedback, like everybody's saying, you know, the idea is nice, but I wish there were more concrete scenes and you get that feedback from three editors, maybe it needs more concrete scenes, right? And maybe you go and, and revise. Um, but I think, you know, you develop a sense for it, right? Like I, I have pieces that have been rejected over and over again. And I'm, you know, I'm just like, fuck that. I know this is good. I'm going to keep sending it out until somebody takes it. And then I have other ones where like, after the second or third rejection, I'm like, yeah, you know what? You're right. Fine. <laughs> you know, I let it go. And when I don't care enough anymore to keep sending it out, then like, why bother? Right? Well, so I'll wrap up with a question um, of profound significance to me. <laughs> Again, me, back to me. No, but um, so, so when you're talking about, you know, when you send it out and you're like, man, okay, I'm done. Like, so Lily, you write these intensely personal, beautiful pieces. Why? Why? Why, why do I write them? <laughs> why do you write them? Yep. Um, you know, I ask myself that sometimes. Um, I asked you now. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, you know, a lot of times for me, it's, um, it's how I understand and make meaning out of my own experiences. Um, you know, I write about a lot of hard and heavy and dark stuff because I want to make something beautiful out of it. You know, maybe that sounds a little cheesy, but um, that is the truth. And, you know, usually now that I'm not, you know, I'm not full-time freelance writing where like I have to push myself to come up with ideas and like have to come up with X amount of ideas every week, you know, which like, I don't think you can do that all with personal essay. You will be completely emotionally tapped out and you'll write a bunch of stuff that's like not up to par and you'll sell out your own trauma for the click farm. But anyway, maybe that's another conversation. But now that Makes I'm not doing that, yeah. <laughs> I, um, 
I really, I, I only write essays when I get an idea and I can't stop thinking about it. You know, and usually the process of thinking about it and coming back to it and be like, well, if I were to write that essay, I could talk about blah, blah, blah. And like, oh, maybe I could incorporate, you know, this book that I love or whatever. And like, it exists in my head for a long time until finally I'm like, okay, I have too many different ideas for this piece to hold them all in my head anymore. Like they need to go somewhere and leave me alone because I'm like writing this essay in my head every time I take a shower. So I guess I'll open a document and like put it somewhere. Um, and get paid for it. Right. Yeah, that's nice too. And that's a whole other discussion about getting paid. Okay. So, so, all right. I am acutely, um, I, I am a time guru. So Zach, if you can, I'm, I'm going to the concluding pleasantries part of this. So, um, Zach, if you could kindly, up oh, there we go. Venmo, PayPal. If you want to donate to the Rio Center, it will all go to scholarships not to support this genius, but actually because um, a rich creative life is uh, a luxury a lot of people don't have right now. So if you have a couple shekels you're not use them, using, we'll take it, thank you. Um, right. Buy, burn it down. Buy, burn it down. Zach's gonna put a link. <laughs> it, and you actually have to set aside time. I, I couldn't read it in one go. I had to like read it and call my therapist and you know, <laughs> Really, it's really, really good. And then the best way to get in line for negative space is to follow Lily. Here we go, Zach. Lily on Twitter or Santa Fe Writers Project on Twitter. We're expecting pre orders probably around July, um, exact time TBD, but I will definitely be crowing loudly and incessantly about them when they are available. So finding me on Twitter is the best way to get harassed. So that's a wrap, folks. Thank you Thanks all. So much. This, this is, is a cool. strange and terrible time, but this has been the best part in my <laughs> very, very dark week. So thank you, Lily. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Zach.